Special thanks to Atlas for providing me an early copy of Shin Megami Tensei 5. Hey everyone, Tony for... I've been waiting for this! Here. I mean, Tony for you. In Shin Megami Tensei 5, Bethel is an international organization headed by gods of every denomination and region. These figureheads are depicted prominently throughout the story, and play an important role in the overall narrative and conflict of the game. Who are these gods though? They were deemed so important that they would be the representatives of their entire religion, so let's learn a little bit more about them. Let's dive into the lore and backstory of each of these gods and see why they are the specific divine beings chosen to work together in beating back the forces of chaos. Before we get into the video, I just want to plug my Patreon. I'd really love to focus more time on making videos for you all. Every little bit helps, and you'll get your name at the end of every video, along with some other cool stuff. Sorry for the interruption, let's get into this SMT lore proper. Odin, meaning the Furious, is the Allfather of the Aesir, head of the principal gods of the Norse pantheon. Some of these gods include Frigg, Odin's wife and goddess of marriage and prophecy, Thor, Odin's son, and god of thunder and protector of mankind, as well as Baldr, another son of Odin and god of light. Odin serves as the supreme leader of the Nordic pantheon and his domains span across many aspects such as war, knowledge, victory, healing, hunting, and even poetry. In the dawn of time there were two realms, a land of ice and a land of fire, and between them the gap was thinning. Once these two realms met, they formed the first Jotun, or giant, named Ymir, and a cow whose milk was used to sustain him. From the sweat of Ymir came more giants, and from the cow's licking of the nearby ice was the first Aesir god born, named Budi. Budi had a son who married a Jotun giant, and in turn had three sons of his own, one of them being Odin. Once they reached adulthood, Odin and his brothers banded together and killed the primordial giant Ymir. It's said that the blood that spewed forth from Ymir was so torrential that it drowned every other giant except for two, as well as killing the cow used to create the Aesir gods. Those two remaining giants fled and eventually repopulated their species. After this victory, Odin and his brothers used the body of Ymir to shape the world itself, his various body parts making up the earth, sky, and ocean. Together they created light and dark elves, spirits, and animals. Then finally, they needed something to worship them and from that wish came the first humans. Odin created a fence to protect humans from the giants, then created Asgard to watch over them directly above. He then married Frigg and fathered many children, as mentioned before. Afterward, Odin would travel the world of humans accompanied by two ravens named Hugin and Munin, who would relay information to him as he wandered, testing mortal spirits. Odin was never one to rest, and would often seek out knowledge at any cost such as his suspension from the world tree for nine days to learn runic letters or his visiting of the great giant Mimir. Mimir oversaw the well of wisdom at the foot of one of the world tree's roots. Odin wished to drink from this well. In exchange, Mimir asked for him to share the all-seeing vision he carried. In response, and without hesitation, Odin plucked out one of his eyes and placed it within the well, then took a drink. Even with all his wisdom, however, he could not see the deception of Loki, the half-giant, whom he asked to be his blood brother after being impressed with his charisma and power to shapeshift. Due to Loki's actions, the god Baldr was slain, and the oath between Loki and Odin was shattered. This event was the beginning of Ragnarok, meaning doom of the gods. The events of Ragnarok lead to Odin being swallowed by the giant wolf Fenrir, and the world tree Yggdrasil breaking. The world receded back into darkness. Though light came once more to the land, the gods were no more. Well, that pretty much covers all of Nordic myth, and in SMT5, Odin is an amazing representative for this branch. I mean, could they have really gotten anyone else? His never-ending pursuit of knowledge and lust for war being put on the forefront, beating back the forces of chaos. Odin's wisdom shines through as well as he waits for the perfect time to claim independence in pursuit of the knowledge taken away from him hidden in the humans, to become a Nahobino and reinstate the order prior to Ragnarok. Odin's motivation and willingness to sacrifice anything for knowledge and power led him to be a major hurdle in the quest for the Empyrean. His choice of design is very accurate, with his one eye and crow companion, as well as his signature spear Gunnir, a very well executed depiction of the character in the story of the game. Khonsu, the Egyptian god of the moon and time, his name meaning the Traveler, together with Thoth, he marked the passage of time. Depicted as being the son of Mut, the mother goddess, and Amon, god of air. Khonsu is almost always depicted as a child, with the side lock of hair being a symbol of pre-adulthood in Egyptian culture. 
His headdress being a full moon perched atop a crescent moon is also very common for moon deity depictions. Early portrayals of Khonsu make him out to be a terrifying figure strangling lesser deities to death and eating hearts, but later is shown to wear a falcon head like Horus, who is associated with protection and healing, wearing a sun disc atop his crescent moon crown instead. Khonsu's more ravenous nature was used in spells and rituals to oppose demons. A statue of him was sent to the room of a possessed princess whose body was inhabited by a demon too powerful for any priest to fight. The Oracle of Khonsu sent the statue inhabited by the aspect Khonsu who determines fate, and once it was placed in the room, the princess was immediately healed. As time passed, in the New Kingdom of Egypt between the 16th and 11th century BC, Khonsu was said to be the greatest god of the great gods, and most temples were centered on him. The temples are especially well preserved to this day, and on the walls were depictions of Khonsu as the great snake who fertilized the cosmic egg in the creation of the world. So, which of these aspects of Khonsu is true? I can't say for sure, but these beings transcend time, so both could be correct in a way. Khonsu is a youthful, spirited god whose motivations and temperament change constantly. This is portrayed very well in SMT5, as he leads Bethel Egypt, but when the chain of command is broken, Khonsu gives up all claim to world power and sets his sight on another goal. Khonsu's goal of purging sickness mirrors his tale of healing the princess perfectly, and his pride as a young god cannot allow him to fail in this task. Khonsu, despite being out of the race for the Empyrean, still plays an important role in the story, and his role as a creator god in his mythology should not be underestimated. His design is very accurate to the source material, being a young god of the moon with his headdress and a side lock of hair. His wielding of the Egyptian Kopesh sword shows a hint of his more brutal side, however. Very well done. Zeus, god of the sky son of the titans Cronus and Rhea. Zeus is the supreme god of the universe in Greek mythology. Cronus, his father, reigned in times before his son, and was told of a prophecy that one of his children would dethrone him. With this knowledge, Cronus devoured all of his children after their birth in hopes of avoiding this eventual fate. When Zeus was born, however, Rhea swapped the baby for a rock wrapped in cloth in hopes that at least one of her children would escape this horrible fate. Infant Zeus was taken to a cave in Crete and was nursed by a nymph called Amalthea and guarded by young warriors who clashed their weapons to mask the baby's cry. When Zeus grew to adulthood and learned of his father's unusual activities, he led a revolt against all of the titans called the Titanomachy. He forced Cronus first to regurgitate the stone he swallowed in Zeus's place, then the children in reverse order. When the war was over, the realms were divided up between the family. Hades lording over the underworld, Poseidon lording over the seas, and Zeus lording over the sky. The earth, Gaia, could not be claimed by one god, so it was shared by all three. Atop Mount Olympus, Zeus would defend his throne as ruler of the cosmos and have the duty of hospitality. Much like Odin, being a good host to others would grant favor from Zeus. Those who were less virtuous and hospitable would be severely punished by him, however. After marrying the goddess Hera, he fathered many children, such as Hephaestus, god of forging, and Mars, god of war. He was not known for his faithfulness, however, and with many other creatures, ranging from nymphs to humans, he fathered gods such as Artemis, god of the moon, and Apollo, god of the sun. Zeus was not the most well-liked god as time went on, however, and at one point he was even overthrown by the other gods of Mount Olympus, but together with the hundred-handed Hecatonchores, re-established order within heaven. Zeus never knowing defeat led to his excess and arrogance, often being depicted holding Nike, the goddess of victory, in the palm of his hands at all times. In SMT5, Zeus is portrayed exactly how you might expect an almighty ruler of gods with no parental guidance might act. Pompous and loud, with an arrogance to match his power, never backing down from making his voice heard in talks with Bethel, and extremely comfortable with vocalizing his discontent with the status quo of upholding God's rule. Zeus's design is the most unique of the other gods, with the monochrome coloring potentially being a reference to his domain over all aspects of life, good and evil, as well as his dual nature of bestowing blessings and punishments. That, or it's a nod to Danganronpa. Either way, I like it. Vasuki, the serpent king of Hindu mythology. When the world was young, there were devas, Hindu gods, and asuras, divine beings in opposition to the devas. They decided to work together and create a world by churning the infinite sea of milk. To churn the sea, they coiled the great serpent Vasuki around Mount Sumeru, home to both races of the divine. The devas grabbed Vasuki's tail, and the asuras grabbed his neck, 
and from the churning came all things that exist on earth. The essence extracted from the sea of milk was called Amrita, Nectar, or Soma, and is the drink of the gods. During this process, however, Indra tricked some of the devas into holding Vasuki by his heads and inhaling his breath. Due to this, however, poison leaked into the Amrita, forcing Lord Shiva to swallow the venom to save all of creation from being tainted. Vasuki is said to oversee the realms below the earth called Patala, often translated as the underworld, but in this case very literally under the world. Patala is described as being extremely beautiful, sometimes even more so than the realm of heaven, filled with the jewels, beautiful groves, and lakes. Vasuki is lord of nagas and serpents, and despite his realm being mostly inhabited by demons, was a supreme devotee of Lord Shiva, famous for worshipping him. Most likely impressed with his selfless action of drinking Vasuki's mighty poison to save the world, he decided to venerate Shiva as the true savior of creation. Lord Shiva, recognizing Vasuki's devotion, wore him around his neck and blessed him. Inseparable from Lord Shiva, Vasuki follows his teachings and attends to him at all times. In SMT5, Vasuki is a multi-armed snake, this time with only one head, and devoted attendant to Lord Shiva. From the beginning, Vasuki is acting on the best interest of Lord Shiva, and wishes to please him and do his bidding at all times, even going so far as being the last thing he thinks about before being slain by the protagonist. Shiva proclaims that the world should not be created by a being, rather, beings should be created by the world. If Shiva wishes the world to be destroyed, so does Vasuki, a devoted worshipper to the very end. Vasuki's design, aside from the lack of multiple heads as said before, is fairly accurate. Adorned with the jewels of his realm and hands performing various mudra Hindu hand signs, Vasuki may just be following orders, but the word of Shiva is his belief too. A great depiction of the character. Spoiler warning for this next one, so be careful. I'll give you a second to go to the description and click the outro. Tsukuyomi, god of the moon in Shinto mythology, born along with his sister Amaterasu and brother Suzanoo from Izanagi bathing after his trip from Yomi. Tsukuyomi is a lunar god and known for upholding etiquette and order. Back at the dawn of time, there was no concept of day and night, as the sun god Amaterasu and the moon god Tsukuyomi were together at all times as husband and wife. Pay no mind that they were siblings. One day, the food goddess Ukemochi invited Amaterasu to a feast. As she was busy at the time, Tsukuyomi was asked to represent her instead. When Tsukuyomi arrived at this feast next to the ocean, displayed in front of him were a wide assortment of meats and crops. Over the course of the banquet, Ukemochi would disappear and come back with food time and time again. Tsukuyomi, being curious, followed Ukemochi once she left and saw where the food was coming from. Ukemochi was excreting the food they were eating from every orifice of her body. Every. Single. One. Understandably, Tsukuyomi was extremely disgusted, and in a fit of rage from the unsanitary handling of his food, cut off her head. He picked up what was left of the feast and threw it onto the earth, and where they landed, those respective crops grew for humans to cultivate. Amaterasu, upon hearing of Tsukuyomi's violent outburst while representing her, expelled him to the other side of the heavens. From then on, day and night were distinct domains of either god, and they rarely came into contact in heaven. Well, this one was a bit different. There is very little known about Tsukuyomi other than this story, but his status as god of the moon and the importance he places on order and knowledge are hallmarks of the character. In SMT5, Tsukuyomi is interestingly enough masquerading as the Prime Minister of Japan and head of the Bethel branch. He hides his true identity most likely in an attempt to better communicate orderly and politely with his people. Tsukuyomi is always polite and articulate, while coldly executing his plan to reinstate the myriad gods of Tokyo for what he believes is the mutual benefit of the world. While considered chaos in the game, Tsukuyomi genuinely cares for the people of Tokyo and is willing to protect them at all costs, even if that means fighting the gods of the other regions or the player. Ever honorable and forward-thinking, his depiction in the game is a very interesting one, despite the lack of source material to go off. Tsukuyomi's design is one of a well-dressed man rather than an over-the-top god-like being, most likely for the purpose of keeping proper etiquette and comfortably governing the people of Tokyo. Despite being rather simple, I really appreciate this design. Well, that wraps up the lore behind the Bethel branch heads. Learning all about this really made me appreciate the effort put behind these characters. My favorite is probably Odin for his depiction in the game. Let me know what your favorite branch leader is in the comments below, and while you're down there, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. I did not cover Shiva, as he plays a very small part in the game, but I touched upon him in the Vasuki segment, so I hope you understand. 
Thanks for tuning in to this SMT lore video, and I'll see you in the next Tony for You. Have a good one.